Hey, my name is Jad Khalil. I'm a ortho spine surgeon in uh, in Michigan, and uh, I'm I'm lucky to have Dr. Patel and his colleagues. I send them all the tough cases that uh, I don't really enjoy doing anymore. So um, these are my disclosures. I do uh, consult, teach, and also participate in product uh, product design for uh, for SI SI joints um, fusion, but uh, none of the product none of those products are are uh, shown here tonight. So we're going to keep this very uh, agnostic and uh, hopefully free of bias. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy, just kind of some generalities. Who is our patient for SI fusion? Uh, how to diagnose it? Indications for surgery? And a little bit touched on the clinical evidence. I know it's a lot to pack in uh, in uh, 15, 20 minutes, but uh, but we'll try to provide an overview. Happy to answer any questions later. The first thing to know is the SI joint is, is a true joint. So some uh, people don't think of it as a true joint, but it is a, a joint lined by the diarthrodia joint lined by hyaline cartilage, but it's held together by real strong and stiff ligaments. Over age, these ligaments can can kind of degenerate just like uh, any other ligaments in the body that can lead to some of the pathologies that we treat. It's important to note when you look at the lateral aspect of the sacrum, uh, where before I was trained to do uh, any SI work, and uh, I used to think about, I always look at the body of the sacrum because that's where we put pedicle screws. But if I go back to my days when I was an orthopedic resident, uh, we did a lot of uh, SI work for trauma. And as uh, Dr. Cross will point out, the joint is a little more anterior than you think. So when you're looking at that articular uh, joint area, that's more ventral. And when you're looking at lateral, sometimes my residents that are coming on service will freak out when we're trying to put a screw that's on the lateral lining up with the anterior aspect of the body, but it is in fact in, in the joint. So it's just something to keep in mind and just kind of look at your spine model and try to look at the imaging, try to understand it later. There are three main categories of patients that we treat for SI pathology and the most common one, and the one that kind of led me to be interested to start getting interested in the SI joint is the one on the right side, post-spinal fusion. Um, I have the privilege to uh, practice in an area with a group that has been uh, active in spine surgery for, for years, for at least maybe 40 years or so. And so in addition to seeing my own patients uh, come back with problems, I've seen uh, uh, some, some of the, a lot of the patients from my uh, former colleagues and mentors that, um, that have successful fusions but come back with persistent pain and these are the these are the patients that first I started getting interested in treating what's going on with them the fusion looks good and evidence points more to the SI joint the other two categories are trauma and you'll often see somebody who um, doesn't have any other risk factors but had a bad fall typically on their side um, slipped on the ice etc and that led to that degenerative cascade just like any any other joints in the body and the one not to forget about is also uh, pregnancy or postpartum. That is, um, and, I'll, and I'll see one, I'll see every few months, I'll see a typical postpartum. You have to ask the right question, excuse me, started after uh, having a baby. And if you don't ask, the, that correlation can often be missed. Now, in those patients, like I said, with chronic, what's, what's believed to be chronic low back pain, there's anywhere between 15 and 30% believed to at least have part of that etiology related to the SI joint. So you always want to be thinking about it. And if you don't think about it, you'll miss it. And, uh, and sometimes it is multifactorial, but uh, related to facet disease, disc disease, et cetera. But um, you don't want to miss the, the, the possibility that there's an SI problem because the treatment's a little bit different. Now, this is an interesting meta-analysis that was just published last year and uh, looked at all the all commerce final fusions. And they found that the incidence of SI joint degeneration, radiographic degeneration, is almost 40%. But not only that, the incidence of one about one out of four, 24%, has, has actually SI joint pain. And these are patients, uh, so post-spinal fusion patients. In addition, the more fusion you do, so the more fused segments, the more the, that incidence of SI, SI joint degeneration and pain. And that kind of makes sense because uh, you've kind of, transitioning a really long, stiff lever arm where, uh, uh, um, next to the joint. And, um, and we've seen it. I mean, typically, I'll see, I'll see a lot of the old L1 to S1 um, fusions that did well initially, then 10 years later or seven years later have horrible-looking SI joints, and they respond to the injections, to the uh, treatment, et cetera. 
And like I said, this was kind of the first category of patients that I started getting interested in. Now, how do we diagnose it? Um, history, it, history and physical is is almost everything. I would say I was going to say everything, but it's almost everything. So first of all, a history they need to have one of those risk factors. In my opinion, very rarely have I ever seen somebody without any risk factors having true SI joint disease. Typically, it's, it ends up being something else, and very rarely leads to any surgical treatment. So um, in in the physical examination, one of the most important tests, in my opinion, is to ask them to point with one finger to the area of most of, of the uh, the epicenter of the pain. And you know, typically a lot of a lot of time patients will try to kind of make a big circle and say it's all around here. And if you try if you try ask them to be more specific, what hurts when you put weight on that specific side? What hurts when you when you're going downstairs, when you get down from a car, if they point to that area a centimeter a centimeter intramedial from the PSIS, which is kind of the it's called the, the Horton test. Um, is pretty specific, and I we do see this in clinical practice. Now, the SI joint provocative testing, this is something that uh, you need to learn if you want to diagnose SI joint, and they go through a series of five tests typically, um, and uh, this is beyond the scope of this webinar, but typically when we uh, teach our residents and fellows and teach courses, we demonstrate those. The physical therapists are actually very good at these, and let, I learned a lot from collaborating with my own therapist. We usually leave the Gainsland test at the end, and I'll do the first four that are pretty quick to do. And if the if the four or three out of four are, are positive, I skip the last one, which can be quite painful. Now, three out of five tests, so typically you'll we'll have three or four for true SI that leads to a higher suspicion um, in um, in that that the problem may be related to the SI joint, combined with the proper history and pointing to the right um, uh, to the right area. Uh, that to me is the next step would be an injection. And when I do an injection or when we typically recommend doing the injection by one of our interventional people, um, the injection is extremely specific. I recommend at, least, at most two, two, uh, two cc's of lidocaine, 1% or half percent without any steroids. And uh, the injection is diagnostic. We give the patients a sheet and it's a pain sheet that they need to fill their pain level before hour one, two, three, four, et cetera, after the injection. And we're looking for 75% relief, which is the NAS criteria to, uh, to uh, recommend uh, further treatment. Now, we typically do always, always do two injections. So one injection is not enough. And we always do two diagnostic injections. In our practice, I always recommend also trying some therapeutic injections with steroids, and that goes straight to surgery. And, um, and that's kind of our protocol. So two injections, sometimes if if they had relief with one, not with the other, we'll do three injections. Sometimes if it's really ambiguous, we'll send them for a CT guided injection. So we will uh, really vet those patients out before recommending anything. And then I'll recommend as many therapeutic injections as they want. And typically when my pain doctors are seeing those patients, it's not like I ask for a steroid injection, send them back to me. I say, no, take them, treat them. And those that fail treatment, uh, we'll, we'll see them again. As far as surgical treatment, I think... Uh, a lot of us orthopedic uh, surgeons are familiar with some older techniques or some that we've seen in the book, the open uh, SI joint procedures. But for the purposes of uh, this talk and kind of in this day and age, we're talking about the minimum invasive uh, SI joint fixation procedure, SI, uh, SI joint fusion procedure. How is that done? So um, again, this is not uh, meant to be a uh, comprehensive um, uh, guide to how to do the procedure. Import I'm just going to go over the, re the really important and vital parts of the procedure, which to me is, first of all, positioning and imaging. And if you're doing this, uh, this surgery under fluoroscopy, you want to really have the perfect images before you even uh, make an incision. And to me, that's the perfect lateral. You see the sciatic notches are lined, uh, ailer line is, uh, are lined up. The perfect inlet and outlet view. The inlet is uh, in the middle screen, outlet view on the, on the far lateral screen. Typically, we give them a bowel prep. We want to be able to see the foramen up and uh, really uh, know what we're doing. A lot of those procedures are done at outpatient surgery centers now, nowadays, and, um, and that's what we do uh, for most of them. So we really want to make sure that uh, we can see what we're doing. And then uh, the procedure goes uh, pretty smoothly, typically. So uh, the, you uh, draw a line down, uh, down the sacral body, and that kind of gives us our, our inlet view. And then line down the ailer line, and we want to make sure to be caudal with all screws to that ailer line. Otherwise, you can irritate the L5 root. And um, this is where the looking at the spine model, looking at your imaging, can be very helpful. 
Then I typically you place one pin, just uh, cardle to that arrow line. And that's one pin down to bone. We try and make it a dot so it goes uh, straight. And then I place, place two more pins. And uh, then check your inlet, outlet, make sure you ladder to, to the frame now. And then um, here, this is a, you know, depending on the system you're using, uh, some systems allow you to decorticate the joint. Some systems just transfix the joint and then you end up in putting your screws. Again, some screws have those little caps that allow some compression and some don't. Some screws have self-harvesting uh, kind of properties, uh, coating, et cetera. And uh, so that's um, so that's how it will look. Like this screw, for example, the middle screw was, they were too close, so I didn't use one of those set caps for one of them. And that's how it looks on the lateral. Again, you look at that ventral screw, you think, oh my God, it's outside the sacral body, but it is in the sacral iliac joint. And that's kind of the outline of the sacral iliac joint that you start getting familiar with looking at it. Now, beware always, this is actually one of uh, my patients that I was just getting ready to do the procedure at the surgery center, no navigation or anything there. Obviously, I just have a fluoro. And uh, sure enough, I missed a, uh, a Bertolotti or a transitional anatomy here that you see on the, on the left side, if you look in PA, right side, if you look in AP, and um, so right there. And, uh, but those procedures are doable with fluoro. It's, uh, you gotta, you know, there is a little bit modification of the technique. It's just gotta make sure it really stay below that ALO line. And, uh, but better off if you know beforehand, you pay attention uh, to um, uh, follow the technique described by Dr. Patel and, and his team uh, for either navigation or robotic navigation. And this is uh, one where uh, robotics and navigation was used with that um, with this particular uh, robotic system that allows live navigation as well. So uh, very nicely written uh, paper, highly recommended. Now, like I said, multiple implants. There's too many to to really list, and we're just talking about the the uh, lateral SI fusion systems. And then you have all the dorsal allograft, intraarticular, I call them the intraarticular devices. We don't leave these out. I don't, you know, I don't personally uh, perform these procedures, but uh, just talking about the lateral SI uh, minimally invasive uh, implants, um, you have a bunch of them by a lot of the major companies. Some of them that I put an asterisk next allow decortication of the joint and some don't. And so this may be a question for later on. And um, I know uh, Dr. Cross is, is a believer in this because I read his paper. And so when you look at outcomes, um, this uh, uh, randomized control trial by Dr. Polly and his group, again, uh, much higher success rate in the SI fusion group, improvement in BAS, improvement in ODI are maintained at, uh, at two years. Uh, they did have uh, three revisions in the group and typically I quote incidence of complications of uh, screw complication one to 2% to my patients. And sometimes you will have to revise the screw. In um, this 12-month uh, uh, follow-up paper, again, uh, looking at uh, low back pain scores, ODI, and functional scores, including, including the EQ5D, superior in the operative group, and results were maintained at 12 months. Like I said, Dr. Cross's paper, an excellent paper with, uh, with a system that allowed the coordination of the joint, but they also looked at the incidence of bridging bone, which uh, the other papers didn't, uh, the, just the transfixing papers. And they found almost 80% uh, success in, uh, in finding bridging bones. So actually true radiographic fusion at 12 months. Um, when you look at uh, that uh, meta-analysis, looking at all, following all the papers for VAS and, uh, and uh, ODI, you see significant improvement in VAS at 12 months versus pre-op and similarly for the ODI. And this was uh, the, the uh, meta-analysis by uh, recently published by Dr. Polly's group a couple of years ago. So uh, this is kind of in a nutshell what we do for what the SI joint to me is in the DGEN population. Um, what are the next steps if we if we know that a lot of those patients, post fusion patients, are going to have SI pathology? Do we do something about it or not? I was um, um, our group was part of a big randomized controlled trial looking at uh, actually doing uh, for long uh, fusion to the ileum. Um, adding a, a sacral iliac kind of transfixion or fusion uh, device. And, you know, I've just looked at the preliminary data, but uh, the preliminary data tells us that, at, that there is a significant amount of baseline patients that also tested positive for SI problems. And so do, do these people need to be treated from the get-go and rather than waiting um, to, uh, 
um, see them have SI joint problems later. And how about those patients that don't have pre-existing SI problem? If we know that one out of four or one out of three is going to have some SI pathology, should we look to fuse the SI joint when we take infusions to the ileum? And I think that, um, so this is kind of one of my patients in, um, that was in the trial, and you'll see the extra implant there. Uh, this is not something I'm doing currently uh, outside of the trial, but uh, but I'm really interested to look at the data and see. I'm interested in um, and seeing Dr. Coleman's uh, point of view as it pertains to lung deformity and uh, more complex cases as well. So thank you for your attention.